This meeting is now called to order. May we have the roll call, please, Ms. Gwen? Yes. Commissioner Clyatt? Here. Second Vice Chair Wyckoff? Here. Commissioner Hearn, she let me know that she's not going to be in. First Vice Chair Belosky, she's absent. And Commissioner Rappa, she's absent. Commissioner Cabela? Here. Chairman Noble? Here. All right, now uh, number three on the agenda, approval of the minutes from April 9th, 2018, which also includes the workshop regular meeting. Anybody have any changes, comments, concerns, questions? I make a motion we approve the minutes as presented. I second that. Okay, can we take a vote on that? Sure. Second Vice Chair Wyckoff? Yes. Commissioner Rappa, she's absent. Commissioner Cabela? Yes. Commissioner Hearn, she's out. Commissioner Clyatt? Yes. First Vice Chair Belosky is absent. And Chairman Noble? Yes. Number four on the agenda, new business, TCH 2008-03, proposed amendment to part two, code of ordinances, chapter 110 zoning, article two, site plans, division two, review procedures, creating section 110-50, designating site plan review categories and separate review processes, and adding hearing requirements, amending, Section 110-51, Scope of Review and Division Three Plan Requirements. Section 11071, Submission, Contents for Consistency. Staff, do we have a little presentation? Just, just now have a presentation. Yes. All right, thank you very much. To give you some background. Okay. Um, to give you some background, um, some of the difficulties I think politically that the community has had over time is um, related to the fact that there's no site plan review, there's no community input to the site plan process at all. Um, honestly, never been anywhere where large site plans received no public hearing. So my proposal has been that we set up a, a tiered system whereby large site plans would go to a public hearing here at the Planning Commission. And um, you would be holding a quasi-judicial hearing. Those are not wide open. You have to, you know, review the facts. Um, and then we would step down from that you know, which things were kind of intermediate, the staff would be able to handle them, and then even below that, things that are rapid review don't involve the full staff for review. There are some things that may even fall below that, we just permit like fences that come through with, you know, their regular building plan review. <clears throat> so what I've proposed, and um, what you have in a whole lot of words and graphs in your packet tonight, um, is that we, we set the criteria for what all those breaks are in the site plan process. So um, to begin, the, um, the proposal is, and I'm not sure how, oh, that's how I do it. Okay. Okay. All development would require a minor, an intermediate, or a major development review in accordance with the thresholds that are in the table. You have the table in front of you. We have a presentation for our large public gathering here. Um, so for residential, currently what the, what the plan 
has, or LDRs has, is just a breakdown for residential and one for commercial. And commercial re involves all this really large site planning um, process, and, co and the residential, no matter how big it is, just slides right through as if um, it, it was just a building plan. People will show up with great big residential developments and just bring in the whole building plan. It's already done. Um, and so we really haven't even had a full staff review on residential up to this point. Um, very um, unfortunate and dangerous as well. So the other issue with that is that residential plans um, were so cheap, um, like $100. We, we can't even get you in the door for $100 worth of staff time. So we've really been as a community taking a bath on this. And what it means is the taxpayers have been financing all the development costs for everybody. It's been virtually free by comparison to other places. Even the large commercial plants um, only were charged $300. Um, to give you an idea of the difference, um, plans for a large commercial development that we were charging $300 for now um, are charged at about $3,000 in a med medium-sized city. So it, because it's a big cost, there's a lot of staff time that goes into it, um, and then you have hearings and advertisement. All of that's just, fortunately, we haven't had advertisement because there's been no hearings, but if we're going to do hearings, obviously, there's mailings and postings. There's a lot of staff work that's going to go into this. Um, it's, it's not going to be simple, but um, we definitely need to break out the, the development in terms of not whether it's residential or commercial, but in terms of what impact it has on the surrounding area. So what I'm proposing is that for residential development, um, as you can see in your chart, minor would be um, developments of one to four single or multifamily dwellings, um, developments up to five to 20 multiple family de developments would be intermediate, and major developments, which would require a hearing, would be developments of 21 or more units and at multi, uh, multi-family designation. Now, mind you that anything that required uh, a zoning change, these are things that are already in the proper zoning category, otherwise they would also be coming to you for a zoning change as well. So there's sometimes there are multiple layers of hearings for developments. For non-residential development, it would be new construction or expansion up to 200 square feet of building area should just be minor. That's very small impact um, and probably doesn't involve any parking change at all. New construction or expansion of 201 to 2,000 square feet would be intermediate. That's usually a still a, sounds big, but it's not. That's a pretty small commercial addition, and the staff could handle that with our normal um, technical review committee process. And then for major is new construction or expansion over 20, 2,001 square feet of building area. Also previously undeveloped or rezoned non-residential development of over 1,000 square feet if it's immediately adjacent to residential because then it becomes more of an impact. If you're putting up something new right in the middle of the commercial area, it probably won't affect anybody in terms of the function or its impact on surrounding uses. Um, but if it's gonna be going immediately adjacent to residential, we're gonna to wanna to take the input of the community there. It's, it's best not to wait till later and find out people were uncomfortable. It's really good to have a public process anyway because when the developer knows that they're going to go through a public process, they're more open from the very beginning. And in fact, we usually come in asking what do they need to do. Um, we're more likely to work with the neighbors because they would much prefer to sit down and work everything out ahead of time with the neighbors, find out what, what impact they're worried about, anything that he, he or she can do to alter the development, to be compatible, and to um, work all that detail out so that by the time <coughs> they get to the hearing, everybody's happy. That's, that's the best model. So if they know there's a hearing, they, they're just going to be more open. Um, also, parking and other impervious areas construction. Sometimes we, we have construction or development that doesn't necessarily involve a building, but um, is a, a definitive change in the way that a site works. So parking areas with 
that include up to six new parking spaces or impervious areas of 3,000 square feet, basic excavation, filling, or removal of no more than 100 cubic yards of material. Those are things that we can handle pretty quickly in-house. If the parking area has seven to 40 new parking spaces, an impervious area of 3,001 to 15,000 square feet, they need to go through technical review committee with the staff. Anything bigger than that um, needs to go to hearing because uh, it's gonna be quite a, a potentially big impact. Um, you'll recall that we were just recently talking about the fence ordinance and wanted to be able to put up um, taller fences between parking areas and residential. So, you know, you get a whole lot of traffic through a parking area, even if nothing else has changed, and um, it, it could still have an impact on the neighbors. This is very important here because we happen to be kind of in the parking business locally, aren't we? And we, people are always trying to put, a, put in new parking somewhere or put up uh, parking structures. And even the city and the county have pretty large parking lots associated with the beaches and things. If they're gonna make changes to those, public entities as well have to come through the process. Did you have any questions on that section, the chart? We, I'm glad to ask, answer questions as we go. I've got a question. Is this modeled after some, you know, I'm sure you've done some research and you're finding cities similar to ours that are, that this is kind of modeled after? Yes, I, you know, I've worked template. with over 50 communities in Florida and done a lot of LDR and process review, um, restructured LDRs. This is similar to um, things that I've put together for other cities that I know have worked long term. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, let's go to the next, when we get to that chart, you've moved on to another chart. Everybody isn't there yet. So if you don't mind, let's deal with that all at once. I have another quick question. That, where you have under parking other impervious areas, mm -hmm. for 100 cubic yards, is that uh, like vegetation that's removed? I mean, should that be defined a little bit more? I mean, well, sometimes people have to come in and remove uh, or move dirt around to fix a drainage problem. Um, or, or even if you're going to be expanding um, your parking lot by six additional mm -hmm. spaces, you're going to have to move some dirt. But if you're taking down, you know, a bunch of Brazilian pepper trees, they could take up 100 cubic yards pretty quickly. Sure. So if it's 100 cubic yards of dirt, that's if it's a little just easier to... Yeah, if people are just doing maintenance to their um, properties, we usually work that out under landscaping, um, different kinds of development. And again, the next step would be that it went to intermediate. It would go to the staff, not to the board. They still wouldn't have to have a public hearing. But yeah, if you were going in, you know, doing a lot of dirt moving, we're going to need to look at it by law because of the floodplain management requirements. So there's, there's out here when you move, you move dirt, you're affecting floodplain and drainage. So everything has to be reviewed by engineers. Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should change it. You could change it to soil or, or yes. dirt or something. And then I think an intermediate, you should say more more than 100 cubic yards, because we have the uh, minor less than 100, but then we forgot to say an right. intermediate more than 100 cubic yards. Right. Um, exactly. I I went through that carefully. I know a number of places have done it this way because. Um, the point being for that if whatever you're doing is under 100 cubic yards and it, it may not even involve uh, parking or uh, laying down any impervious surface, that it's minor if it's under 100, but if it's over, um, we could put new criteria under, we'd have to put under intermediate and major for, for the amount of material that's moved.
So let me, um, I can, um, we don't have to move this forward at the time. It'd be a good thing if we did, but if you have some ideas, otherwise I'll sit down with the staff and come up with um, some cubic yards measurements that, that the engineers think are probably warranted, if, if that'd be acceptable. So um, now the levels of development um, review that any activity that's below the thresholds identified as rapid would be reviewed in conjunction with the building plan. I mentioned that earlier. The developments that include components of, of more than one threshold, like you only have six new parking spaces, but you're putting up 40 apartment buildings, or that's kind of hard to imagine, I know, but the idea is that whatever um, the highest category you trip is the one that you'd be reviewed under. Now, in the next chart is um, to give you an idea as you begin talking about what kind of review is required based on whether you're ma minor, intermediate, or major. <clears throat> and along with creating these categories, we've really created an internal review process as well. We'll designate the technical review committee as the staff that um, reviews typically site plans. And I have begun pu putting them together in an internal process and tracking our hours and things of that nature. We've been kind of practicing. Um, and it would involve the, the planning, uh, engineering staff who we consult with. Um, sometimes there are planners or consultants as well uh, for assistance on minor review. And, and actually, I get some input on major too because it's just so much to review for one person. But um, also we would get input from public works. And um, at times, if it's a major development, you'll find, you'll find the technical review committee also um, and sometimes inter intermediate, it will involve input from FDOT, or the Water Management District, the county, um, anybody who has any permitting authority over it based on how large it is um, would be involved in that technical review committee. Now, the, um, for minor review, um, we're going to have a pre-application process. This is a really handy thing. We, we set this up years ago in Gainesville, and we call it first step up there. Um, the idea is that the staff is all together, technical review staff is all together one day during the week. They schedule meetings, pre-app meetings, and uh, people come in and tell us or drop off something ahead of time to let us know what they're going to have us commenting on or what, what they're proposing out there in the future. And they get input from the staff that's really a courtesy review. It's not any final, we aren't bound to our comments being the only thing that, that it be considered in the review. But just the basics of concerns that the staff will have over that development, things they need to be keeping in mind, making sure they know which portions of the code that they're gonna be answering to, what kind of permits we think that we're going to need from which agencies outside and inside. Um, and it's just an opportunity to make sure that you're meeting with everybody before they finish, finalize their design and turn in their application to, to get them to do a better application right from the start. Um, with the major, it's important that we get together so that they understand that um, they're going to have to do community neighborhood meetings as well so that when they make their application, they need to have already been out in the community um, close to where the development's going to be, let the people come in and talk to them in the neighborhood, um, and that, that re the report on that has to come back to as part of their application. So just making sure they understand all of their obligations through the development process. Um, it's a really handy um, thing to be able to do, and people tend to do it naturally anyway. They, they come in and pitch ideas to the staff all the time. So um, it's that is something that we recommend for a minor. Of course, they have meeting with the whole group if you have a minor plan. They usually come in and meet with me and maybe with Frank. Sometimes I'll uh, bring the engineers in if it's, it's, well, almost everything's on the water here, but um, <laughs> if it involves um, grading issues or drainage or anything like that. With the intermediate and with the major, that would be required. They need to have a pre-application meeting ahead of time so we know that they've got everything in place before they bring in their app. <clears throat> now, 
Neighborhood workshop is not required for minor. You wouldn't have to do that. It's not required for intermediate if people want to do it or they think it's going to be controversial because sometimes even small things can be controversial. Uh, we recommend talking to the neighbors first. Sometimes even with minors, I tell them, maybe you should go talk to your neighbors first. Um, or they bring their, send their neighbors in. We, we get a lot of that too. But it's definitely going to be required for major review. Um, the TRC review is absolutely required because that's the process the staff goes through to um, review every plan when it comes in to make sure it meets the minimum site plan requirement, that all of the application fees are paid, and that um, that meets comp plan um, and, and any other design overlay or other conditions that are associated with it. There's a public hearing um, approval that would be required for the major. It would be required of intermediate or of minor if they're requesting a variance, but it would be heard by the, the magistrate in that case, except for those non-conforming um, uses that we talked about last time, the possible extension of non-conforming, so those will be coming back to the, the Planning Commission for a public hearing. And then following the hearing, because you, as you see as we go through this, you may be recommending approval of something Almost always, if it's a major development plan, people leave with an approval with conditions. And I, I think Ralph will attest to that. Hardly anybody gets an approval outright. There's always some atta uh, condition attached that the staff recommended or the, 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 com the neighborhood recommended. So if they get a conditional approval, then they need to, when they bring their final plans back in with all the corrections and the responses, um, we check to make sure all those conditions are included before issuing a final um, approval for their site plan. So an application for a development plan or amendment to any previously approved development plan would be approved only if the plan met submittal requirements, the LDR, all the code requirements, it included all payment of fees, complies with the schedule, the notice, any public hearings they were required to have, and that, of course, it meets the comp plan and any overlay districts. And I'm going to go through this material that you have in front of you underlined really quickly, and I took well, some of the words out of mine. Before you go there, back on the mm -hmm. table you just finished, it says if the TRC or board, uh, do we have a board here, or is that like a remnant from another city? No, it would be the TRC um, approval or this, well, I should say commission. I'll change that to commission because it should be the planning commission. And, or in, in, unless it's reviewed by the magistrate. It could also be a magistrate. So I'll fix those. TRC, commission, or magistrate. Yes. Mm -hmm. We're not going to have a public hearing for intermediate? No. It would remain a, a technical review. So why did you choose that or recommend that? Because there, almost every place, there are certain things that are low enough impact you don't really require um, a full public hearing. And what would the threshold be here? Those are all listed in the previous chart. We went over the, the so first chart. A 20 unit apartment building would not require a public hearing? Correct. And then a 40 uh, new parking space parking lot would not require a public hearing? Correct. And it would not require a neighborhood work workshop either? Correct. Okay. And nothing requires that now, so we're adding it in. But at the same time, trying to stay flexible that if things are coming in and they're consistent with their zoning and they're, they're not located next to residential, remember, because that trips the, the hearing as well. We're talking about basically commercial things in the middle of a commercial district. That Where's we, that about not being next to a residential? It's on the first chart. Exactly where, because I don't see it in all Under the main. spots. Okay. This is a little cumbersome as I don't have. Mr. Brooks, it's on your chart under major, bottom right corner, non-residential, new construction or expansion over 2,001 square feet of building area previously undeveloped or rezoned non-residential developments over 1,000 square feet of building area adjacent to residential development. Okay. So we have that also. No, because if it's adjacent to residential, it's automatically major and requires neighborhood. Major. Right, I think that was the. Right. Is that the clarity you were seeking? Would that also okay. apply to the 20 unit apartment building or, or more than 21 unit? Well, that's major, so it would be 5 to 20 unit. 
That, that designation under non-residential is any commercial that is over 1,000 square feet that's going to be next to residential, even if it's in its acceptable zoning. Um, so I'm just worried about the 20-unit condo building, say. Well, that's a residential to, use, though. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's multifamily next door to maybe single family or something. Right. We don't like. Sometimes we have condos battling, you know, for buffers and landscaping. And, Right, we do have, yeah, we have requirements for um, setbacks and things of that nature. Um, we it seems to me like a 20 unit condo building in this community would be big enough to warrant a neighborhood workshop with the neighbors. Well, one thing I would, that's up to the board if the board wants to suggest that. I don't want to make it um, a requirement that we do that every time. I mean, I'll have to go back into the fee ordinance and increase the cost of all these things because it costs a lot of money to go through a public hearing process. Um, and also because it costs a lot to develop. And um, uh, if we're looking at things that are in a multifamily district and they're allowed to be there, they have the proper zoning. We have a code that dictates what their impact and their setbacks and everything are already gonna be. Um, the benefit of these public hearings and the workshops, at least with the public hearing, even if you don't have the neighborhood workshop, is you know people get to come in and they know about it ahead of time. They can say what they're concerned about, um, and you know you may decide. I personally recommend, or professionally recommend, actually, that if you do decide you want a public hearing at a lower threshold, we not necessarily require a neighborhood workshop for that because the public hearing would suffice for that. You, you got people coming in talking to you while you're making those decisions. So in essence, you don't need to make them that, go yeah, through. That, yeah, that commission meeting is essentially the neighborhood exactly. meeting that exactly. all the neighbors are invited to attend. Right. I, Mr. Brooks, I appreciate what you're saying, mm -hmm. and I understand where you're getting, but I think there's so few places in the city that would be impacted by that because it's only where it abuts, where, where a larger scale multifamily a possible development project abuts a single family residential area. Right. I mean, I can't even think of one. Well, we, we do have, uh, well, actually usually things at that level no, need we, to be out on the, on but, the beach in R3 yeah. um, or in the commercial mixed use districts. And you're always going to have some edge. You know, we do have houses here and there that are right on the edge of other things. Um, what about the um, parking too? Like say you were putting in a new parking garage of less than 40 or a new parking surface parking of less than 40? Well, garage spaces cost um, $20,000 a piece. It's really hard to make a garage work for under 20 parking spaces. Um, so that, that's really unlikely, but. Um, Here we have 40, we have to, up to 40 for right. no public hearing and no neighborhood workshop. But that would also be impervious areas of under 3,000 square feet. Under 15,000 for intermediate. For intermediate, it, 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 Intermediate gets no public hearing. Right, right, for under 15,000 square 15, feet. Mm -hmm. Under 40 new parking. Spaces. Right. I agree that I, I think want, there should be a public people, hearing on those. I just yeah. want you to, to think about the numbers. That's that a good being, point. But yeah, Christ, I'm not choosing the numbers or advocating for them. I just right. want you to blindly take these numbers because you guys live here. You know how, what the numbers yeah. should be. I think, you know, I don't know how, how many parking spaces should trigger it. Right now, you know, staff is suggesting 40. Then you'll have a public hearing. But 35 or mm -hmm. 39, you wouldn't. And then same with the uh, 20 condominium uh, unit building. So it's up to you guys to decide where you think the line should be drawn. I mean, I have some cities where they pick up everything bigger than a duplex, which is really mm -hmm. crazy. And then <laughs> mm -hmm. other ones that are uh, more selective. So, and every city has a different fabric. Like you said, in this city, there may not be any 20 unit condo buildings anywhere, but next to some uses that would not want to comment or not have a concern about a 20 unit building next to them. Might yeah. just be next I, do, I do caution about going too low because um, we don't also want to give the impression that mixed or a multifamily of a low intensity is somehow an unacceptable land use and that people who live in multifamilies need to be 
separated away from single <laughs> yeah. family people. Well, yeah, but like where you get but you, public hearings is conditions of approval. Yeah, but lighting, like exactly. Those are the things that it's kind of a it's kind of a performance standard issue. Once you have you know more multifamily, then you have a parking lot instead of small parking areas. Well, in this case, you're out on the beach, so you're going to end up with going up. The parking's going to go up, and then we we have them wall it off. So. Um, was there a happy medium in there that we? It's think, up to you. I, I don't think that I don't think the numbers are bad that you're using as far as the thresholds. I think that's a, those are fair trip switches, um, but I do think, in, to Mr. Brooks's point, that if there's a 40-unit parking area or garage going next to uh, or very close by other residential mm -hmm. less intense uses, that could be seen as not so fun for those people that have mm -hmm. those properties because a, a 40 unit parking place especially if it's nearer the beach is going to get a lot of turns uh, and it may generate a little more intense use what is there a happy medium in there that we don't do this the whole neighborhood giant meeting and do as you say where we just have a a public, public hearing mm -hmm. where then the public does have their ability to come at any time because it's posted and they can right. speak and they get their time to speak is, is that something that you would view as a, a, a acceptable sure. uh, happy medium to put in there and that way it gives the public their ability to it's, voice up, their it's up to you I mean this is that's what you're here for well but I'm, I'm, I'm deferring to your professional if experience you want, if you wanted to do that you would just change where it says public hearing approval just say required and cross out if requesting a variance so you would have it even if they're not requesting a variance for intermediate well I I don't recommend that we have public hearings for every five units that come in it's pretty low intensity, but um, if you want to break it out and say um, public hearing for um, any development over this number, I mean, what do you think well, in terms other, of impact? Yeah, the other way to do it would be go say go to residential and take out 20 and make it go five to 10 or something like that, and then parking instead of going seven to 40 being intermediate, go seven to 20 or something like that. And throw the rest into major. I, I really, but then if we do that, much, if we do that, then we're requiring neighborhood meetings. So I would rather it just if we could just let the board talk for a minute and talk through it. Neighborhood meetings aren't required for intermediate. I know. So right. I'm saying if you make the intermediate, but I don't want lower than than it would be on the other side. Yeah. Right. Right. I was just there. Were, they could have like a tier in there, um, partially because it meets with. The that fee ordinance <laughs> we don't have to amend <laughs> that again but um, you could do a tiered approach in there for the intermediate um, and say you know how many at what point do you think well yeah I mean if something you, you would want to have your, a public hearing over on your first column where it says developments of 5 to 20 multifamily multiple mm -hmm. family dwelling units if you had some kind of a subcategory where you exactly. did 5 to 12 was this and then 12 to 20 that's what i'm saying and that and that felt that still remained under your intermediate problem. category but it would right. have some little subset right within it and then um i think the new construction's fine as written and then with relative to the parking spaces where you would do something like 7 to 20 correct uh, parking spaces falls under so what smaller subset and then 20 to 40 goes so what there. do you um think in the number of units whoops you said five to twelve, and then twelve to twenty. That that would be my okay idea. You know, I'm obviously open to what anybody else might suggest. I'm just mm -hmm. using that as a. Glenn, could you write number. that down? Because this isn't let me work with it. It's five um, for <laughs> residential. It's five to twelve, and then for parking, um, seven to twenty. I'll know what that means. <clears throat> and then what do we say for parking? Seven to twenty. Did I say 12? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so 20 right. by so, so staff 20, approval with for, no public for 20, hearing. Yeah, for 21 to 40, you would have a public hearing, but you wouldn't require a neighborhood. Right. So the lower segment, you, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting at this point is the lower segment that we just amend, that we just added, the 5 to 12 right. for the residential units and 7 to 20 parking mm -hmm. units would, would be as you have it written. Right. Right. In your, in your recommendation under intermediate. Right. And then for the larger subset, we would simply add um, the public hearing. Yes. That's not not neighborhood meeting. Right, that's that what stuff. I understood. Or, yeah. It would stay in the intermediate category, but it would have a, a layered. Yeah. 
So are we going to have public hearings on these? This is my question. Uh, on on what I'm what I'm suggesting, and obviously it's open for debate, but uh -huh. where I'm throwing out here is anything over 12 units of resident, new residential multifamily development would then have a public hearing, and anything that would redevelop a parking situation where you have more than 20 units of 20 parking, parking spaces, spaces, up to 40, because then once you trip 40, now we're in major and it's got the neighborhood meetings and it's got all the other stuff. I, I don't want to, you know, I think that's onerous to have to have neighborhood it's, meetings. And, it's and we're borderline onerous having to do a public hearing, but I think we have to take the public's input at heart on some of these projects, because 20 units in this area is a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it could have what a perceived negative impact, and we should at least hear what some of the people have to say. Okay. Okay, so um, the review criteria, to, to go over quickly, um, an application for development plan or amendment to any previously approved plan um, may, may receive approval only if they um, have met all of the fees and submittal requirements and the comp plan, as I think I did that one earlier. Then the pre-application technical review committee meeting um, has to be prior to filing an application for the development plan, as I explained and uh, comments made by the staff at this stage are made solely for preliminary informational purposes. The, they would still need to file then after that an application and the, the, the completeness of the application, the details of what's required would be provided them of course on our forms and um, that their fees and attachments um, and all other information is deemed necessary by the technical review committee and the code would be determined for completeness by the staff. So we check all that up each time and we don't move forward if we don't have a complete plan, which should resolve some things that we've gone through here before. But what I'll also be bringing back to you site plan criteria for us to break that out into levels too, because we have a huge list of things that are required for site plans, no matter how big or small they are, and it's sometimes maybe not appropriate. So. Um, we're going to go over that as well, and I'll try to also formulate all of that into charts that are easier to, to use. It's much easier to, you know, find a chart and figure out where you stand in a process as opposed to reading page after page of material. So we're going to try to reorganize that for you. Um, and in regards to the completed application, now when there's a neighborhood meeting, that has to be transcribed and they have to provide us with records of that each time, uh, which is standard practice for big developments, especially here because all your big developments are PDs. We'll deal with that at some time in the future as well. So um, the review procedures, to go over quickly, a board review, if the board review is not required, then the technical review committee will look at the application and um, they will come back with uh, comments and findings and in conclusion, supporting the committee's decision, um, which may include one of the following. And this is a process we do anyway, come back with comments. Um, finding that all requirements of, and criteria have been met and that we can issue a final development order. Or find that there, all requirements could be met with some specific conditions and issue a preliminary development order. or deny the application based on a determination that the proposed development, even with reasonable modifications and conditions, does not meet the review criteria. Those are pretty standard. And we are frozen. Oh, there they go. So if, it's catching up. Let's see if I can get it to go back. So we'll move on and go from imagination and memory. So if a board approval is required, we have a public hearing. It would be a quasi-judicial hearing because these are site plan applications. You would hear the presentation and, and you would, we'd provide you with all of the technical recommendations from the staff ahead of time. You would take public hearing from um, people that are impacted and then you would um, discuss among yourselves 
um, based on the criteria that's been provided and the facts of the case, whether that it is um, approvable um, as is, whether it's approvable with conditions, in which case you could do a um, conditional development order and send it back to the staff to make sure that all those conditions are met, or you can deny it based on the fact, just as with the plan, the staff re review, that there's so much wrong with it, it's not ever in this format gonna come, can't be fixed. Um, I haven't put anything in here to this effect now. Quite often, a community will say that if you've, you've put in an application for something, you, you can't apply with the same thing for a certain number, certain amount of time. Um, but usually with site plan, you let them come back in if they wanna go through the process and they really have reorganized everything. It's usually zoning that you limit, not so much site plan. Um, now, it's really important that you be aware of the fact, and I'm sure before we start getting into this, we can get Mr. Brooks to give us a whole nother presentation on quasi-judicial proceeding because um, we'll be needing to establish findings for your recommendations. You, so you'll, you'll have to kind of train yourself to be able to specify why you're approving something and how you see that it's met the criteria. Of course, staff will come to you with recommendations, and my recommendations always include a set of findings. So that's a big, good starting point. But the board often has other things that they either add in or take out or disagree with. Recommendation is not a final, uh, is not in no way binding to you, but we'll always try to provide you with um, potential findings. Yeah, the main idea is to stick close to the criteria and standards that are there and then articulate why you think it meets the standards or why you think it doesn't meet the standards. And that makes it easier to defend in court and the courts have something to review. Right. And we are still just making recommendations. No, this would be, no. Quasi-judicial hearing, my proposal is this is the final hearing. If they want to petition or for appeal, they would go to a magistrate after this. But our recommendation so. on this board goes to the other commission for approval? No. We yeah. could set it up different ways. There's different cities have different uh, ideas. Um, sometimes the city commission will be the ultimate decision maker. Other times the city commission will delegate it uh, to a special magistrate, which we have done for variances in the past, uh, or delegating these public hearings, which have never been held, to you guys. So you would be the final say at these public hearings about developments, whether they get approved or not. If it's done this way, if the commission decides they want to keep final uh, approval, you would be a recommendation advisory board, and then they would have another public hearing to decide uh, whether to approve or not. It's a, it's the staff is proposing it now, it would delegate it to this commission so you would make the final decision but most places don't have a double quasi-judicial hearing you don't yeah, my usually opinion, go to a quasi-judicial yeah. hearing that just recommends to another board that, that i mean in, in all the communities i've worked with that's yeah my opinion is kind of like double jeopardy now it is the way we have it is you have to come here just to get our recommendation and go through all the hoops and go through all the procedure and then we just recommend it and then the board of commissioners says well, tell me all about it again, and, and you have to go through the and whole And that is the case when you're acting legislatively, if you're doing uh, changes to zoning and land use and policy and things of that nature. Of course, you're being advisory at that at that point. Sure. Uh, as the, the LPA. But um, what, what's being proposed here is that you are the Development Review Board or Commission. It's, so you have two, two different hats to wear. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and in some cases, in some cities where there's a whole lot going on, or if they have trouble distinguishing uh, among their various hats and which to put on, um, they've broken those out. So they'll have a development review board or commission and a planning board and commission. But we have a hard enough time filling all of our vacancies in a small population now that it would be pretty difficult for us to do that. And, and it's gonna be a challenge for this board because typically the board that does the quasi-judicial hearing has criteria for membership that include engineers and people with building experience and real estate, and that's not always the case here because we don't have the set of criteria. So it's fortunate when we get that group, but there's no guarantee. So it could be quite a bit of an educational um, process getting some people up to speed on how that Is that something works. down the line you think should be instituted as criteria? I would recommend it, but the, again, the population's pretty small. It's pretty too much hard to do right that. Now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's hard in a smaller city right? Uh, because yeah. you don't have enough right. uh, people living out here, yeah. yeah. 
The, the other thing to keep in mind, I know everyone wonders, what's legislative, what's quasi-judicial? So what we're doing now is legislative. We're writing the rules. Mm -hmm. And then when you get the rules adopted and you put them on the left side of the desk and then you get an application <laughs> from someone and you're saying, does this application meet the rules that we adopted? That's quasi-judicial. Quasi Understood. And so quasi-judicial, the thing to keep in mind, too, is you're not supposed to have ex parte communications with any of the applicants or the neighborhood if someone tries to talk to you say there'll be a public hearing please come and talk there um, you're allowed to talk to people about legislative so you know if someone wants to talk to you about these criteria or public hearings you're allowed to do that that's legislative you're allowed to have ex parte okay. communications there um, in the quasi-judicial hearings you're supposed to decide does this application meet this criteria and you're supposed to be limited to what you hear at the public hearing You'll hear from staff, and Linda will present the codes, requirements, and you'll hear from applicants and their engineers and sometimes their lawyers. Um, and then you'll hear from the public and sometimes their experts who might oppose something and their lawyers. And then it'll be up to you to decide, does, they, does this application meet the criteria that we adopted or not? So it is kind of useful that you're the ones adopting the criteria uh, because you're, you will be the same commission that applies the criteria in the future to applications that come forward. But it does concern me very much if we're qualified to make some of those decisions with the engineers well, and the you remember, attorneys. And you, you know, you have, a, you have an engineering and planning staff working for you. And this, these will all have gone through a complete TRC review. As it stands right now, there's no public hearing and we do it all anyway. Okay. So <laughs> we're going to be bringing it to you and making presentation and and the helpful thing is that with the public hearing, um, people can come in and they'll make observations from their place, you know, uh, in an affected area that none of us really would have imagined. Um, maybe experience they had with the previous building, because a lot of what we do is redevelopment here, or um, just knowledge they have of how traffic is working in the neighborhood. And, um, and also, like um, Ralph mentioned, or somebody mentioned lighting, the, the impact of lighting and things like that. And we, tried, we all try to catch that stuff ahead of time, but people who are living there maybe already have experience with something. With the major developments, I have to say, it, it, it's really handy because a lot of times the developer's willing to take care of things that aren't actually really his responsibility to, to kind of help out the neighbors, you know, and um, we'll, we'll help take care of some neighborhood things here and there, too. It, yeah, it can work out. At your level, you won't have to calculate floor, floor area ratios. No, we won't. You won't have things. to count parking spaces or count units. Uh, Staff will do all that for you. You'll be hearing concerns from the public, how to address the concerns, if they've been addressed, if they meet the criteria. And we'll be providing you with a bigger packet than what you're used to because we, you're going to have copies of the site plans, photographic studies of the sites. It's a pretty extensive packet, besides which we will have already conducted a very in-depth review. And so if it's a big development, you may even be looking at traffic studies and water management district stuff. And, I, and not everybody will be able to read that. Some of you will. But we'll be here to explain it to you. So the staff will have to, it, it's going to be costly for us. The thing that we did work out in the fee ordinance, though, is there's a set, a much higher set fee for all of these things. But then beyond that, if the development ends up requiring more effort than is covered in that, then they get charged on an hourly basis for everybody's time in the staff so that the city is not footing the bill for something that's unexpectedly complex. The last thing we want to do is say, well, we're done reviewing it because we've used up all the budget on this. You know, that's all the review it gets. I mean, if it ends up more complex um, and it takes more time, then they have to pay that fee before we issue the final development order. Um, the um, so the, the where you have a if they have a preliminary or a conditional development order because there were sets of conditions they had to make, they'll have to go back and make all of the, those on their plans and then come back to the TRC, the Technical Review Committee, and we'll go back over it, and make sure they're all met. Um, we do this all of the time anyway. It's pretty standard that plans come in with several iterations by the time they're they're finished. Um, we're not always the most popular people in town. I know that's a surprise, but <laughs> no, um, the, um, then we also um, they'll have a notice that the preliminary development order does not constitute a final, so they can't be 
turning dirt that just gives them confidence enough to go ahead and finish out their plans and bring something in and they know what the, they've got the end in sight. Um, that they still have to meet all the ordinances, regulations, and laws that are required for any additional amendments to the proposal. Um, an initial determination of concurrency will have to make sure that all the facilities and um, utilities and everything that's the impacts that they demand um, from initially as near as we can tell. That was interesting. Um, <laughs> It just started moving around on its own. That, that we're sure that they're going to be able to meet all the um, conditions, uh, the impacts. That'll play into our um, requirement for um, impact fees as well. That'll all be when, when that all gets settled. And you'll be seeing that when it comes back around as well. Um, for final development orders, um, they're going to have an approved development plan, a certificate of final concurrency, an expiration date for the final development order. They're usually good for um, a year, um, uh, six months to a year usually for a final development order, and um, with the opportunity to extend one time um, without having to go back to hearing. The reason that we do this and we don't make it open-ended is because Impacts change, you know, and they may be concurrent now, but they may not be in two years. And if you're not going to build, somebody else is going to use up that capacity. So um, you either build within a reasonable time frame or you're going to have to come back through for review. What um, is that time frame? They need to start development within a year to keep the, it active, and usually you will allow them like, at least one six-month extension as long as they come back and request it and we can from a staff perspective, look and make sure that nothing terribly unsettling has occurred with concurrency issues. Um, but because people need a little time, something that looks like it's ready to go, they may have financial things to work out or property, you know, to train in a long time, what a long time real estate transactions can sometimes take. Um, and just working out exactly the deal uh, before the, and then, uh, Consider this as a site plan too, which means they still have to go through the building plan review. If they bring in a big complex building, sometimes it takes them a really long time to meet all of the conditions for the building code and floodplain management and such things. So you do you don't want people to have to go through a process because the whole community ends up going through it. Okay, so. The, um, so amendments to an approved development plan go back through. They all go back through as if they're a new development plan. Um, once the final's been issued, it's unlawful to change, modify, alter, or otherwise deviate from the terms and conditions of the order without first obtaining an amendment. Now they could come back in with a really small amendment, an adjustment that kind of falls under minor, you know, uh, the adjustment to where certain they put their dumpster or something of that nature as long as that was not um, one of the conditions listed. As you all have seen, when you do development and you start getting things on the ground, you have to have some flexibility in the development process. But anything that trips um, uh, interme intermediate level or um, major level change to the site plan or that addresses any condition that was D delineated as a condition within the site plan or in the hearings, um, that will have to come back for amendment to the public hearing process. People do try to amend things on the fly. So um, these processes all require us to be out on the site regularly and check to make sure they're actually building things according to plan. Um, for the most part, once to be, because we're a very small staff, we don't have a budget for inspection, site inspection and engineering on site. So for the most part, their engineers and, and their planners, their, mainly their engineers, sign off that everything is going to be, is going to meet all of the conditions and um, they are responsible for that liability wise. So if something isn't working and we're aware of it, we'll stop them. We will put a stop work order on things and make them come back in and fix it, no matter how expensive it is. And I've seen some really extensive 
site changes and building changes made because people put the wrong things in. So, right, so that's that process. Are there any more questions or comments? You said there's a, a new fee ordinance you're proposing. Is that going to be something that would go concurrent with this? Right. The fee ordinances, fees are adjusted, should be adjusted annually. But we had to, and this time, had to structure it entirely different because, as I said, we really had practically no fee structure and no review structure for land development. So I had already put fees in the new ordinance that would cover all of these levels before we knew what the levels were going to be. I, I, I knew what the structure was probably going to look like. And so I wanted to get those in place since the ordinance, that ordinance was ahead of this one. It, 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 they had started working on that in September last year. Do we call them major, minor, um, intermediate in that? Yes. Okay. We just call them by the labels? Right. Okay, good. Yep. All right. If I can gain control of my... You will need to discuss more or... Um, so are you looking for us to... This is a standard ordinance change, so I'm asking Those for you to recommend, make, make a recommendation, move approval and re or, or denial or approval with changes or changes that we mentioned earlier would be good in, in regards to the breaking out the intermediate level. So we need someone to make a motion? Yes. I can do that. <clears throat> I would like to make the motion that we take the staff's recommendation for um, the proposed amendment to part two of the code of Or ordinances chapter 110 zoning article 2 site plans division 2 review procedures creating section 110-50 designating site plan review categories and separate review processes and adding hearing requirements amending section 110-51 scope of review and division 3 plan requirements section 110-71 submission contents for consistency uh, my motion is to accept the proposal with the minor changes uh, that we brought forth to the intermediate category to include a subset of the intermediate category for residential developments of 5 to 12 units uh, to not require the public hearing, from 13 to 20 units to require the public hearing, under the parking category from 7 to 20 parking units to not require the public hearing and from 21 to 40 units to require the public hearing. That all come out okay? Yes, it did. <laughs> so let's take a vote. Or we, we need, need a, a second. second. Sorry, second. second. I second the motion. Now we could go to the vote. Okay. Second Vice Chair Wyckoff? Yes. Commissioner Rappa? Absent. Commissioner Cabela? Yes. Commissioner Hearn is absent. Commissioner Clyatt? Yes. First Vice Chair Belosky, she's absent. Chairman Noble? Yes. And moving on, um, Section 4, New Business, B, TCH 2008 04, proposed amendment to Part 2, Code of Ordinances, Chapter 110. Dash zoning, Article 3, Stopping Standing Parking, 3, Division 1, dash generally adding a section for prohibited on street parking, providing for definitions, providing signage requirements, and providing for penalty and enforcement. And do we have a staff presentation? We do. We have another very exciting black and white slide presentation of the material that's already in front of you. Um, we have had some um, problems with parking, as you can imagine, throughout the community for some time. And um, the, the sheriff's office who does our parking code enforcement during the day have recently noted that the ordinance doesn't actually um, provide anywhere that they can ticket because it doesn't say we can, in, we can install signs. And usually when you put up a parking sign, you'll notice in other communities it says in the bottom ordinance section yeah. that gives it the authority. We don't have that section. Um, so, uh, yes. <laughs> we, yeah. So um, that's a pretty important uh, thing, especially in a place that's frequented by 
double its population on a daily basis for parking. Um, so in the process of looking at where to insert this little citation in the ordinance, I re realized that the entire parking ordinance was uh, weak in a lot of respects and did not provide us the detailed authority to even establish no parking areas or how to enforce them. Um, and so I went through parking ordinances from the more established older communities that have downtown type areas because we kind of function as a big downtown even though we don't have a downtown because of the amount of population and traffic we draw in. So um, I looked at Clearwater and St. Petersburg and Largo places that have downtowns and those common parking problems in alleys and things of that nature. Um, and came up with uh, s some suggestions. As you saw, there's a bunch of underlining there. I'm gonna run over them quickly. I did take some language out here and there just for the sake of the slideshow, but if you have any questions about it, um, be sure to mention it. So parking, parking is going to be listed as prohibited at all times at certain specified places, um, and that you, these are places where you're not allowed to park or stop or stand or hang out too long. On streets, sidewalks, uh, or sidewalk areas where signs are erected giving notice. So it specifies we would be erecting signs in those places. And specifically, some of them are going to be in front of theater entrances, in front of entrances or exits to hotels, and in front of entrances to any building where parking should be prohibited for public safety, and that's pretty broad. But sometimes you have to just kind of figure that out as you go. And uh, the authority to do that, you'll see later. Parking um, so as not to obstruct traffic is a new section. You're not to leave less than 10 feet of the width of a roadway for free movement of vehicular traffic and where streets are not completely paved or curbs provided, not to encroach more than 12 inches into the paved portion. Um, and you're gonna notice as we go through that it's a lot of it is um, we are putting good manners into the code. Because most of us wouldn't do this anyway, but that's right, but it does happen. So stopping, standing, or parking in alleys. Um, that you're not to stop, stand, park any vehicle within the alley except for commercial vehicles and then only for the expeditious loading and unloading of materials except temporary stopping for passenger loading and unloading. Um, no person shall stop, stand, or park a vehicle within any alley in such a position that it blocks the driveway entrance or any abutting property. Parking for certain purposes is prohibited. No person shall park a vehicle upon any street for the principal purpose of washing, greasing, repairing the vehicle. Um, oops, we've got something out of place there. Um, for displaying advertising, they're not supposed to be rolling signs or, or sitting signs out in front of your yard. Um, with the understanding, of course, that lots of professionals have their own signs and things on their car, and if it's in their driveway, that's fine. But um, this is um, dealing with actually taking a car or something out and just leaving it in the street for the purposes of just advertising. Um, selling merchandise from the vehicle, except so it's allowed in markets, and um, that is always going to be a permitted activity. And storage for more than 72 hours, um, soliciting orders for or from which goods, wares, merchandise, fruits, vegetables, or plants are to be sold directly. So we don't allow mobile vending, and that we aren't going to allow it now, but now we're more specific about what those activities are and how it relates to parking and use of the public streets. Parking on narrow streets and avenues. No person shall park any vehicle on the west side of a street or on the north side of an avenue. I gotta double check that again, is that, yeah. Where the paving is um, 28 feet in width or less or where signs are erected giving notice thereof. So if um, these are generally, um, it, it, you're gonna have parking on one side, but we're gonna have to have signs for that. So. It, that's something that we're going to have to look at from a public works 
basis and go around and make sure the signs are in the right place and that the people are parked on whatever side of the street they're allowed and specified if they're not. So um, on 6657, on that selling merchandise, does that prohibit food trucks in the city? We already prohibit food trucks in the city, but yes, this is addressing that as well. Because, you know, sometimes people aren't even really selling from a, an approved food truck <laughs> or a recognized food truck. But right now we don't allow any mobile vending. Unless it's at a permitted event or... Correct. Right. Right. The craft show. Mm -hmm. or the right. Downtown well, some market. restaurants have food trucks now as their main kitchen. That's not going to get rid of those, are they? Yes, it is. We don't allow it here. I, I was surprised that when I got here because I know they've become really popular. But um, in all over the country, they had become really popular. And um, to the point where the brick and mortar restaurants were starting to scream about people coming in from out of town, taking up all the business and leaving. So keep in mind, these are people that um, they may have, they'd have to have a business permit to operate here, but they wouldn't be paying any taxes. Well, I know that and there are some brick and mortar restaurants that use food trucks as their own kitchen. Yeah, but kitchen. Th this is parking on the street. But this not, is not parking they don't on use property. it here in town unless they're doing so illegally. Okay. Now, at the markets, they are. Right, that's I know, right. for instance, Ferbatas have bought a, a, a food truck, and they haven't been able to use it. They know that, and it's very frustrating. They can only use it as events, but, um, but they didn't realize until after they had it that they weren't able to drive it around and park it places. Well, I, I think what Commissioner Noble is referring to, there are some restaurants in town that have a trailer in their parking lot that's a kitchen yes. but this as i'm reading this this is parking on the street right this if the is trailer not is anchored actually it becomes a permanent structure so and they're parked in their own parking lot is different they're not parked in the public yes but we have occasionally shut them down as well because they'll bring new trailers in and in the in the process of doing that um not anchored properly or not placed properly or and as you can imagine they're taking up their own parking which was required parking for the <laughs> restaurant so it's uh we're we're trying to deal with that also in a special parking district that doesn't require yeah. them to have the certain number of parking spaces <laughs> that there's normally supposed to have however they're great grandfather yeah but but yeah the original trailer is grandfathered in. And somehow they got to close the whole street. Extra into stuff is their isn't. bar and dance floor. Their <laughs> and their regular parking right now. Um, anybody, we aren't permitting any expansion or changes of use within even the Johns Pass area because that half parking is long since been taken up. So anybody who comes in, if they're proposing something that's going to a change of use that's going to impact parking, we can't do right now. Because the situation's just like that. Yeah. You know, you had 50% parking that was required, and if, if you built and you were granted your restaurant or whatever your use was, based on that 50%, you can't come back and take up those 50%, that, that parking. That was the bare minimum that was required. And um, it, it's not a, you know, a free-for-all get to do whatever you want. But in a lot of cases too, people have changed uses in those buildings over there. They may have been a, a real estate business and now they're a restaurant generating a whole lot more re regular trips. They should have had a parking review um, and didn't. So we, we've long since busted the 50% because the new uses have been going in there for years without regulation or just adding more tables in. And, and see in the case, that you're talking about when you make a change on the site that means that we're going to have to go in and look at the restaurant and once we go in and we find extra tables and then we realize that that means the restrooms aren't appropriate anymore there's all kinds of things that can happen if you start making changes <laughs> so it, it's, it's all a careful balance so anyway um you're not supposed to be doing any of these things on on the street um, Parking on narrow streets, no person shall park any vehicle. Oh, I think we did this. Yes. Um, on one-way streets, no person shall stand or park a vehicle upon the left side of a one-way street where signs are erected giving notice. No person shall stop, stand, or park a vehicle at a hazardous or congested place, and that's a definition that our parking enforcement 
both Public Works and the um, Sheriff's Office have the authority to decide. The use of restricted parking zones and loading zones, so we have here a definition of restricted zones um, that include loading for um, taxi cab and bus areas um, where they're just general drop-off areas for, for those purposes. You're able to go in and load and unload passengers quickly, but you're not allowed to stay for any length of time. And if you're in one of those places loading and unloading and something that is authorized to be there, like the bus starts to pull in or someone else pulls in to try to park, you're obligated to move out of the way. And yes, we do have to occasionally step in and, and provide enforcement. And sometimes property owners will need to have somebody enforcing that on site if they've got a lot of turnaround traffic. So um, we have provisions here for loading and unloading materials, but that that can't take in excess of 30 minutes. And then um, again, talking about temporary loading areas. Designation of streets or parking is prohibited anytime. Um, just is what authorizes us to post signs and specify which areas those are. Designation of streets where stopping and standing is prohibited um, under certain hours. Sometimes things may be off limits during certain hours or they may be available only for residents during certain hours. That's pretty standard. Establishment of limitations on parking generally. Um, when it's necessary for convenience and safety, the Public Works Department is authorized to prohibit, restrict, or limit parking on any roadway as long as signs are erected, given notice, and limitations on parking where signs are officially posted. Again, when necessary for convenience, Public Works can establish limitations or restrictions for certain times or certain places um, temporarily or permanently, um, and also if you move your vehicle from one space to another on the same block without traveling through the intersection, you are still violating the parking. <laughs> um, each one hour parking violation period is deemed to be a separate offense, so don't figure, oh well, I've got the ticket, I can just leave it there all night. It will add up. So will loading and unloading on the turn lanes of the middle of Gulf Boulevard, are they not going to be allowed to do that anymore? Yeah, that, that is tricky, <laughs> isn't it? It's, it's problematic. A can of worms, I think. It is, because you can't really pull over on sidewalks and... Um, they escape guys, they park there and they unload their equipment, they do their work, and then they load back up and leave. Right, in the middle Air of Gulf. Trucks, yeah. The food people for well, the... Well, they do, Something you know, we, if we... If we with the cooperation of DOT, because it is their roadway. If we post that for no parking, then no, they would not be able to. Then the question is, where do they, where do they park? Yes, because some of our roads are that narrow, or they just kind of stop on the side. I'm sure you've seen that, and then nobody can get past them. Um, there was one spot somebody called the other day. They couldn't get home because. Um, Two neighbors on one side and one neighbor on the other side, all their landscape people were there at the same time. Why they don't share the same person, I don't know. But they all had three different trucks with their trailers and they just couldn't even get home. <laughs> um, any provision of the article imposing a time limit for parking shall not relieve any person from the duty of observing the other more restrictive provisions um, that may be specified by signs and citations in the form approved by the designated law officer um, for violation of the division will be issued by both law enforcement officer and qualified parking enforcement officers. And the penalties for violation will be set in the fee ordinance and that has already been done. Are there any questions? I think I found two missing words in 6657. Okay. Could you take those down, Glenn? Missing words, 6657. Page yes. three, 66-57, um, 56 parentheses five. Um, it should say customers for the purpose, I think. 
It says customer's purpose. It should say customer's for the purpose. Oh, yeah, the second line, to be sold directly to the customer's for the purpose of soliciting orders from. Thank you. Then I don't understand the occupants of the immediate premises only. Actually, I think, uh, Mr. Brooks, I think it should be or for the purposes of. Or for the purposes of. If you read that through, um, fruits, vegetables, and plants are to be sold directly to the customers yep. or for the purposes of soliciting orders from. Yes, I'm sorry. Or sale to the occupants of mm -hmm. the immediate premises only. What does it mean, the immediate premises only? Is that the uh, guy food trucks at the, at the place he was talking about? Like, or the guys that are selling your steaks when they pull up and they park in the street and run up to your door and want you to buy the steaks that fell off the back of another truck that they're trying right, to sell exactly. you. Exactly. Okay, I see. Makes sense. So it'll be or, or for the purpose. And a motion could be made to recommend approval with the uh, corrections provided for that section. Anyone? I have another comment that I, I know the city of St. Pete does it, and I'd like to see us maybe think about it, depending on what everybody else feels, that if you get a ticket, you park, your meter expires, and you go back one time, you get to send a receipt in with the ticket, and they waive it for you. Because I hate to see a tourist come in. They get a ticket, you know, what do they say? They come on vacation, go home on probation because <laughs> they forget to pay the ticket. That's pretty you know, and Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, it happens too. People are like, oh, a $15 ticket. Next thing you know, they got a warrant out for them because they didn't pay a ticket where, you know, they should follow the rules. But they have something like that in the city of St. Pete, if we could. That's probably something that needs to be addressed in the fee ordinance. Okay. What do you mean they send a receipt from a local business? We don't yeah, local business. But you, were, you were here, you know, you, you made a mistake. You send it in, so you, you take care of it, and they waive your, well, I think it's one time in your life. You get it waived. Yeah, how do you even administrate that? Because do you do it by driver's license number, by person's name, by license tag? I mean, I, I get what you're saying, and I appreciate that, because I, I don't think we want to penalize our tourists right. because they feed our local businesses. But, man, how do you administrate that? You know, it seems like it would be pretty that. onerous. Uh, we, we used to do it here. We still do it. I, I really don't know. Uh, we, I'd have to. I can um, make a, a, an administrative recommendation from the plan board to the city commission, um, but that's a, an issue for the fee code. Okay, yeah, that would be Just a, something to think about. I think it'd be a complex matter, but I appreciate what you're saying for sure. All right, if nobody else is going to do it, I'm going to be the guy making all the motions. <laughs> Uh, I make a motion that we accept the staff recommendation to approve petition TCH 2018-4 and recommend uh, the BOCC amend Code of Ordinances Chapter 110, Zoning, Article 3, Stopping, Standing, Parking, as proposed, with the minor amendments proposed to Section 66-57, Paragraph 5, to add the words uh, or for the purpose of. I second the motion. Thank you. Can we get the roll, uh, get the vote, please? Yes. First Vice Chair Belaski is absent. Second Vice Chair Wyckoff? Yes. Commissioner Hearn is absent. Commissioner Cabela? Yes. Commissioner Rappa is absent. Commissioner Client? Yes. Chair, Chairman Noble. Yes. All right, moving on. New business, Section 4, C, TCH 2018-5, uh, proposed amendment to Part 2, Code of Ordinances, Chapter 110, Zoning, Article 5, District Division, Districts, Division 3-R-2, Low Density Multifamily Residential, Section 110-206. Setback requirements. 
Amendment to reduce setback requirements for townhouses to reflect closer consistency with other uses in the permitted district. City staff. Yes, thank you. This, um, this section, along with all the residential sections, really do need to be amended because there are some real difficulties here, especially given the fact that our lots are so small and we're pre-developed. And since I've been here, people have come in a dozen times looking for the opportunity to do a duplex or a triplex or a townhome. And although we say in the code they are allowed, we have not been able to find any place to put them because these, the, the way that the area that's required, for instance, you have to have 3,000 square feet of land area in order to do uh, a, a duplex or a triplex. Um, and our lots are only 40 by 80 in a lot of places, or 40 by 100. So it, it requires two or three lots combined in order to do a triplex, in which case, why are you doing a triplex? You could do three single family homes. You know, there's no, there's no incentive or no advantage to it anywhere. Um, and in this case, townhomes, for some reason, which is anything of four units or more, require a 25 foot setback on each side yard, which means you lose a whole lot. You, you have to have like five lots combined to do four townhomes, which is definitely not reasonable. And in addition, there is, there's no nexus to show that there's a greater impact of four townhomes that require 25 foot setbacks to a triplex which requires nine. You know, if, if there's just nothing to state that one extra unit is so much more impactful that you go from having eight feet, 18 feet of total setback to 50. So um, there, there's just nothing to warrant that. Um, so what I'm proposing is that they be treated in the same way that the triplex is. Um, that you go to nine feet of setback um, on each side property line. It's the only thing I'm proposing at this point. I would like to come back um, and talk about this when we've got time to lay it all out and see, you know, really explore um, how much square footage is needed for each kind of use and what we're trying to accomplish and what ways, for instance, we can regulate impact differently than just prohibiting them outright. It's not good to have something in the code you say you allow, but then you prohibit it at every turn, and it, it just can't be built. And that, that's kind of the situation we have. We've had some, some really um, nice looking proposals for townhouses here and there, but there wasn't, that space is big enough that had a whole extra lot you could throw in. And sometimes more than a lot. If your lots are only 40 feet wide, you have to have more than one extra lot just to do your setbacks. And there's nothing in the code that specifies what the relationship was, be, you know, in that decision. Um, what the impact is that requires that level of protection from the neighbors, for the neighbors. It's, so my recommendation is to change the 25 foot setbacks for townhomes to nine for the side setbacks. You're not proposing any other uh, rear setback changes or any of that? Other? No, the rear is really so not that bad. Um, yeah, it, I'm with you on that. And the front? And the front, the front is consistent with what's allowed everywhere else. The back is usually actually pretty minimal. Um, and it, which is a good thing, because we actually have a lot of non-conforming lots. You know, where you have to have, to be a conforming lot, you need 40 foot in width and 80 foot in depth. Um, the two of them together, however, if, you're, if you meet the two minimums, you can't put a, you can't even build a single family on them. Yeah. So a 40 foot wide, 80 foot deep lot is substandard. We couldn't let you build on it. We've got lots at 144th, 145th that are 40 by 60. Exactly. And fortunately, they already have houses on them. Um, and some of them have no backyards because the interior lots you're talking about 
are, they were really kind of designed as single lots and then split. Sometimes there's single lots that go all the way through. And you know, we've got cases there where we sometimes have what appear to be whole lots that are vacant because the, the 40 and 80 or the 4,000 square foot proportion keeps them from being developed. But there's not enough combined with the lot next door to, const to, to warrant a duplex or triplex because of the 3,000 per unit requirement. Right. So it's, it's very difficult. So that's, that's in your... That's coming. It's on your radar too. Yeah. Okay, good. Because that, that was a concern that I've had as I go through some of this stuff where we see there's there's no way you can make it make sense. I mean, in theory, we uh, we allow it, but in practice, exactly. it's not permissible. Not permissible. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think we need to make the the spirit and the intent <laughs> and and the letter all match up. Yes. I'm missing where the change is, actually. Oh, it's very hard to stop and find, isn't it? It's um, number 3F. Um, let me see here. It's not, these aren't page numbers because it's under section 110206. Just one number. Three? Oh, there it is. Okay. I see it. Number it's at the very top of page it. four. Mm -hmm. You change 25 to 9. It's the only yes. one cross out. It's hard to find. Yeah, sorry about that. My, I, I kept I looking you. and looking and I was flipping through the pages trying to figure out where the change went. It's just one number under one line. number. Yeah. yeah, everything else stays the same for now, right? Yeah. It's like wow, where is it? I just can't find it. <laughs> so twenty-five to nine is a big difference. Do you? That's the number that. It's it's okay for for triplexes. For triplexes, that's what it is. Right. And the height is the same as houses, yeah. and the height is no different. Right. Plus, remember, your adjacent property also has a side setback. So it's not nine feet from the next house. So, it's nine feet from the property line. That, how, that home would also have a setback. Exactly. Right. right. All right, can we get a motion? I second the motion. We don't have oh, we somebody make <laughs> You want me to do it again? Very good. Oh, no, well, oh, thank, I thought you were if I had, uh, I wish I had more money-making skills than just making motions. But uh, yeah. I will make the motion that we uh, accept the staff's recommendation for the approval of TCH 2018-5 as proposed. And I second the motion. Can we go to the vote? First Vice Chair Belosky, absent. Second Vice Chair Wyckoff? Yes. Commissioner Rappa, she's absent. Commissioner Clyatt? Yes. Commissioner Hearn is absent. Commissioner Cabela? Yes. And Chairman Noble? Yes. And moving on, uh, number five, old business. We have none. Uh, Planning Commission discussion, we have none. So our next meeting will be June 11th, 2018 at 6 p.m. This meeting's adjourned. Thank you.